The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, welcome to your Reckon and Next Australia monthly tax update webinar. My name is Deborah and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately one hour and if you'd like to ask any questions, please email us at training at reckon.com and we'll take these questions offline following the webinar. The Reckon and Next Australia monthly tax update webinar will cover recent tax developments in Australia. Our presenter today is Roloff van der Meer, and Roloff is the National Tax Director of Next Australia and is responsible for ensuring that Next Year stays on top of all the latest tax developments. Roloff has the ability to deliver technical tax information in an easily understandable and commercial format to tax and non-tax people. I will now hand you over to Roloff for today's presentation. Thank you, Roloff. Good. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that introduction. So anyway, there's a picture of me, my contact details, phone number and email, etc. If you have any tax questions, by all means, please call me or send me an email. I'm happy to help. So today's webinar, it's our July tax webinar, and I'll be talking about developments that happened in June 2018. Uh, first things first, uh, our plain English disclaimer. Please note that this presentation is not advice, and any representations or tips you believe you may have heard or seen are not advice. Please obtain your own advice from a suitably qualified professional. The main purpose of these webinars are basically just to get you thinking, to um, inform you of late recent tax developments and to get you thinking and to ask questions about that and how it may potentially affect you or your clients. So just a quick recap, in May we had the budget, there were some measures proposed, I listed some of the most important and the most recent measures that can apply. For individuals, the low and middle income $530 tax offset and celebrity pictures, I think that's only proposed to apply from later, not from 1 July 2018. Basically saying you, if, if, if you're a celebrity and you want to, you know, sell your picture to put it on coffee mugs, etc. Currently, allegedly, a lot of these celebrities use family companies or family trusts, etc. That rents out the rights to use these pictures. With the effect that the family company, say, is only taxed at 30% or 27.5, depending on the turnover of the company. Uh, when this measure becomes law, the government proposes, I think it's around the 1st of July 2019, that celebrities renting out their picture or the rights to the picture, they must do it in their own name. And because celebrities and especially sports people, etc., earn a lot of money, then it will be taxed at the highest marginal tax rate of 47%. Businesses, there's some proposed R&D changes. Um, the 20,000 instant asset write-off has been extended for another year. So it applies for the 2019, the current year. We just ended the 2018 year on 30 June 2018. Superannuation, in the budget there's proposed new contribution rules and some admin rules and other measures that were proposed is to combat Phoenix activities and combat people operating in the cash economy, i.e. people who earn money but in cash and don't declare it. Some bills that are not yet law, there's a brief overview. Some of the big issues and that has basically everyone uh, a bit uncertainty is the company tax rate bill, um, especially this one, the third one, enterprise tax plan base rate entities bill because that bill proposes a new concept for base rate entities. Uh, as you are well aware, currently any base rate entity will be taxed at 27.5%. For the 2018 year, the current definition, that was last year, the current definition is a base rate entity is an entity that carries on a business and has a turnover of less than 25 million. Then with this point number three, the Enterprise Tax Plan Base Rate Entities Bill, everyone thought it would receive royal assent before 30 June, it didn't. 
But anyway, that bill proposes that a new concept for base rate entity. So under that proposal, a base rate entity is an entity that has a turnover under 25 million and 80% um, or less of total income is passive. Um, yeah, unfortunately that bill did not pass. So we stick with the current definition of base rate entity. If that, if this bill does pass somewhere in this year, people potentially, and they've used the proposed measures to define a base rate entity, people may potentially have to go back and amend their tax returns. But again, it's all in the letter of the law. Um, we'll see what happens, you know, maybe for equality purposes, um, what to do. Anyway, keep your eyes peeled, always interesting. There's some exposure drafts, etc., And some consultation papers, the cash payment limit of $10,000 consultation paper, basically a measure proposed in this budget to prevent people operating the black economy so much. So if you make a cash payment of more than $10,000 to a business, you can't make it in cash, then it must be done by EFT or check, etc., to leave a paper trial. So overview, for the purposes of making it more practical and more relevant for your clients, we've divided the presentation into seven sections dealing with company taxes. So if you have companies that are your clients or yourself are operating a company, this section is relevant for you. Family business tax issues, indirect taxes, individual tax issues, international tax issues, superannuation tax issues, and other tax issues. So starting the ball rolling, we're gonna talk about company tax issues. Uh, again, I refer back to that previous bill that I mentioned, the 80% passive income test, etc. This bill, everyone, it's supposed to apply from the 1st of July 2017, therefore for the just past 2018 year, where it proposes that companies with more than 80% passive income will not be base rate entities. So if you're a company, if this bill does become law, if you're a company that earns 81% of passive income, you'll be taxed at 30%. It's the new proposed definition of a base rate entity. Uh, now it will just be for 2019, the aggregated turnover will be less than 50 million and the base rate passive income is 80% or less of total assessable income. What is base rate passive income? They go, give examples in the EM, they say it's dividends and franking credits attached. I have a note, non-portfolio dividends is not passive income. That will be active income. Now, what is non-portfolio dividends? Non-portfolio dividends is basically, let's say I'm a shareholder and I own more than 10% of the shares in the company. Any dividends I receive on that holding will be non-portfolio dividends. Such dividends will not be deemed to be passive income. Other examples of passive income is rent, interest income, royalties, net capital gain and above amounts flowing through trusts or partnerships. A vanilla example to work out what the percentage of passive income is, because we're dealing with an 80% test. So in this worked example, very simple, a company with a turnover of under 25 million, or for 2019 turnover must be under 50 million, receives dividend rent interest income, that's passive income according to the slide before of 600,000, net capital gains of 250,000, that's also passive income, and then consulting income, that is active income. So total income will be a million dollars, passive income will be 850,000. Uh, find the percentage of passive income, it'll be 85%. Therefore, because the passive income is more than 80% of total income, the company will be taxed at 30%. Note as well, for this 80% rule, flow through amounts will retain their character. So in this, but mainly by character, it means if it's active income, it will remain active income. If it's passive income, it will remain passive income, etc. Or dividends, it will remain dividends, etc. So situation one, company pays a dividend to the trust, then the trust pays, normally it would be a trust distribution, but in this case, it retains its character, so it, it stays a dividend. Um, that's situation one. Situation two, the blue trust um, conducts business activities and derives trading income from the business activities. Then the blue trust pays to the green trust, trading income keeps its character, and the green trust eventually distributes to the company 
also trading income, it retains their character. Will passive investment companies be carrying on a business? Um, this, this is the conundrum that's currently quite ripe in the Australian tax law, especially because under the current definition, you're a base rate entity. If you're carrying on a business and your turnover is under 50 million for 2019. Uh, and then as well, there was this TR 2017 D7 released, um, point three, stating what does it mean for a company to be carrying on a business? And there's sort of an implication, basically a lot of passive entity, passive activities that in the past, we always never regarded as carrying on a business, can now potentially be construed as carrying on a business. So note this, um, this all came from in 15th of March, 2017, orbiter comment, that means just like a passerby comment was made in a case that actually dealt with tax residency and central management and control, et cetera. I think it was the Bywater case. Then on the fourth of, and basically saying passive companies, passive activities can potentially be carrying on a business. Then Kelly O'Dwyer, the minister, uh, came out, she said on the 4th of July, 2017, tax rate cut was not meant to apply to passive investment companies. However, then on the 18th of October and the 2nd of November, there was an update on TR 2017-D7 on what it means to carry on a business, when a company can carry on a business. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of passive um, activities were caught up to mean carry on a business. Anyway, that situation, it's still a bit uncertain. We hope to get certainty in the near future. So next up, reportable tax position. Um, who needs to do reportable tax positions? Our RTT schedule is a schedule to company tax return requiring large businesses, uh, basically a business of a turnover over 20, 250 million to disclose most contestable and material tax positions. There's three types of RTP schedules, category A, category B, category C, etc. cetera. Um, it's just basically, it's all a methodology to help the ATO get more information about taxpayers, et cetera. And I assume report or tax position, you know, you report everything you're a bit uncertain about. Uh, category A, position is likely to be correct as incorrect. Category B, where there's uncertainty over the taxes that's payable or rec recoverable. And category C, where, as you're well aware, the ATO often issues taxpayer alerts, warning people about potential schemes that are doing the round. If your transaction has anything to do with that or potentially can, you have to report it under category C. Note there's no need to disclose the reportable tax position if you have applied for a private ruling, because in that case, the ATO knows uh, that such kind of transactions exist. Or applied for an advanced pricing arrangement. That's basically a transfer pricing uh, issue. So it's, yeah, it, it is a way just to get more information for the ADO about the taxpayers. Family business tax issues, that's the next big session. Uh, there's a proposal to extend the $20,000 instant asset write-off by another year. As you may be aware, uh, 20,000 instant asset write-off, that's quite a good deduction available for businesses. Um, if you buy, if you run a business, you buy any, um, piece of equipment, etc., costing less than $20,000, or office furniture, etc., you can get an instant tax deduction. Um, it was due to finish on the 30th of June, 2018, and luckily the budget extended it by another year. Note, if it ends by the 30th of June, 2019, the $20,000 instant asset write-off will revert to only $1,000 write-off uh, the next year. So hopefully they keep on extending it, but don't know. Fighting against the cash economy, the Treasury Laws Amendment, Black Economy Task Force Measures Number One Bill 2017. It's in the Senate. Um, dealing with taxable payment, it will now make people in the cleaning and courier industries must also report what amounts they pay to their contractors. Note there is currently a taxable payment reporting regime in place for construction, people in the construction industry. Basically because uh, the government and 
yeah, government basically believes, you know, a lot of people in the construction industry engage in Phoenix activities. Phoenix activities is basically where the company goes belly up without paying superannuation guarantees, et cetera, to employees. And then starts in a new guy, new form, uh, just in a different form and continuous construction businesses, et cetera. With this all taxable payment reporting, it's just to, a way to increase the sort of transparency. Like say, for example, I'm a contractor and I work for a building company or now a cleaning and courier company. I do, they pay me cash in hand, I don't declare what it is. So the ATO wants to you know, get data matching to try and avoid people not paying their fair share of tax. Also, you're not allowed to use sales suppression software. That is basically to combat the cash economy. So for example, people have tools in their businesses where it's supposed to ring it up and leave a paper trail, et cetera. With this, I'm not an IT expert, but the sales suppression software can wipe the data regarding a sale like that. So, okay, anyway, the ATO said in this bill, if you use that kind of equipment to suppress the data, uh, you'll be in trouble. Small business CT changes. On the 18th of June, 2018, there was a discussion in the Senate, but it's, it's, it's not, or it was scheduled for discussion in the Senate, but it's not yet law. Anyway, under these changes, originally they applied um, proposed changes, or originally it was supposed to apply from the 1st of July, 2017. Now there's talk about, um, because small business, selling your small business is such an important issue. And to make it retrospectively apply from the 1st of July, 2017, but I thought that might be a bit unfair. There's now currently a proposal, note it's not yet law, to only have it apply from the 8th of February, 2018. What does that mean? That means only if you sell a business after the 8th of February, 2018, you'll have to consider these changes. If you sold a business between 1 July, before the 8th of February, 2018, you don't need to consider these changes. But anyway, everything is still speculation, not yet law. Um, what these proposed changes are about, it is um, if you sell shares in a company, um, shares or units in a trust, there are additional conditions, three additional conditions that must be met. Uh, basically, some initial observations, the object entity, that is either the company or the trust in which you sell the shares or the units, must also meet the six six million dollars net asset value test or the two million dollar turnover test and carrying on a business etc be a cdt small business entity uh, there'll be more details in later webinars and um, this is actually a very interesting and very complicated area of the tax law most as you're well aware the small business cd concessions it's for small businesses that turnover of under two million and carrying on a business or six million dollars net asset value meaning asset minus liabilities quite good for concessions you can exempt your capital gain under a 15-year exemption there's a retirement exemption the rollover etc and yeah and a CT discount as well it's good concessions to have but it's very difficult to qualify for these concessions because the legislation can be quite complicated this just adds more to the complexity of that, but only applies if you sell shares. There's additional conditions, more complicated conditions that must be met. Note just why the government proposed these changes. This following example illustrates it quite clearly. So in this example, we have Richie Rich. He's very rich. He inherited $200 million. He does not carry on a business. So he can't be a CDT small business entity because a CDT small business entity has a turnover under two million and carries on a business. This person does not, and also does not. He also does not satisfy six million dollars net asset value test because he has assets of more than two hundred million. He owns twenty five percent of the shares in a large trading company that's huge. Say like for example, BHP Billiton, etc. Clearly not a small business entity. He wants to sell those shares. However, if he sells it now, he won't qualify for small business CT concessions. So Richie is smart. He um, restructures or he does something else. He buys the little corner shop that only has a turnover of 500,000. 500,000 is less than 2 million. So Richie is now a sole trader CDT small business entity. 
So he can sell 25% of the shares in a large trading company and qualify for the concessions if it also meets the active asset and CT concession stakeholder test, et cetera. The active asset and CT concession stakeholder test are current conditions that must be met for the small business CT concessions if you sell shares, et cetera. But now under the new proposals, basically the object entity, the large trading company, he if 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 those proposals do become law, Richie Rich would not qualify for CET small business entity concessions. Um, because under the new proposals, the object entity must also either be satisfied the six million net asset value test or the CET small business entity requirements that's carrying on a business or less than two million dollars in turnover. TD 2018-9 says there's no reduction for interest incurred by objects of discretionary trust to borrow money and on lend to trustee interest-free. Um, what this deals with, as you're well aware under trust law, the beneficiaries, before a beneficiary is made presently entitled to a distribution from a trust, in discretionary trust, such beneficiaries are actually called objects of a trust. Objects of a trust only have a right to be considered to be a beneficiary. Only once they have been considered to be a beneficiary, usually through a trust resolution made before 30 June, they become beneficiaries of a trust. And they have then have they presently entitled to the income of the trust and they then they they they, they have a right actually to qualify for income from a trust. Before that time, such beneficiaries are only objects. They only have a hope to be considered. They don't have a right, they only have a hope to one day get a right. So this TD just clarifies and says that no deduction will be allowed for objects that borrow money from a bank because the object is not yet presently entitled to any income of the trust <coughs> and any future entitlement is too remote. And as you're well aware under Section 81, there must be a nexus between um, doing the expense and the derivation of income and as an object it's too remote that you might potentially get a trust distribution because you're 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 not even a beneficiary yet so some questions ask can the following steps help to make the interest deductible for objects make the object presently entitled at the start of the year um no that won't help because you're not yet certain um, how much distributable income will exist for that income year and how much will be distributed to the beneficiary. So even if you make objects present in the beginning of the year, it won't happen. Trustee makes an irrevocable resolution to exercise the power of appointment in favor of the beneficiary. No, it will not help because we'll only become present in title by trustee and legally available for distribution. So this TD just clarifies that. Note uh, the hooky, it's an AIT decision. Um, no small business CET because you failed the $6 million net asset value test. Note there's been a lot of court cases regarding valuation of assets and liabilities in an entity that sells uh, another business or another assets of the business uh, regarding the $6 million test because valuations can give different uh, results, etc. Um, basically, in this case, what happened? The Mr. Hooky sold six childcare centers and made 1.6 million capital gain. Mr. Hooky applied for the small business CT concessions on these based on the 6 million net asset value test, saying the value is less than 6 million. Uh, however, the value, um, this it sold for a higher price than 6 million. However, the seller believed the sale price was too high, so wanted to use a lower purchase price as market value for the assets. Uh, unfortunately, the IIT said, no, that's not possible. You must use uh, the value for which it was sold. You can't just kind of make up a lower value. That's not market value. Market value is what it was sold for. But as I mentioned before, there's numerous cases in the 6 million test and valuation, is valuation shortcuts people are trying to take. Finish with family business, now I want to indirect tax issues. Um, TST, okay, this this has received royal assent a long time ago, but it only applies on 1st of July 2018. 
So, so far, the 2018 year is a few, 2019 year, apologies, a few days old, but it applies from now. Basically, under this importing low value goods, there will be GST obligations. So, overseas business vendors who earns more than 75,000 turnover from Australian sales only, that provides low value physical goods, for example, goods costing less than $1,000 per each product. For example, you buy books through Amazon, etc. To Australian customers must charge GST. So they have to register for GST. Although this is already law, um, I foresee some problems enforcing it against, you know, big multinationals. I think it was recently in the press where Amazon said, if you, if, oh, they, it's a practice they adopted. If I'm in Australia, I go on the website, I just want to buy a Kindle book through Amazon, less than a thousand dollars, of course, books are cheaper. Um, I can't go on the US site, etc. It pushes me to the Australian site. It's because Amazon International wants to avoid all the admin that's um, affiliated with this, this new measures. Because Amazon in the US will have to register for GST, etc. Australian GST, etc. They just make it push everyone onto the Australian Amazon site, etc. Note, Australian-based vendors that drop ship will also have to charge GST from the 1st of July 2018. So say, for example, you buy something from overseas, and it comes from a factory inside the Philippines, etc., to Australia, there'll be GST on that transaction. Um, there'll be no GST on overseas business to business supplies, provided Australian business purchaser provide overseas business with the ABN of the purchaser and a statement that the purchaser is registered for GST. Note the previous one was like, for example, business to consumer. So say, for example, me, myself, or my personal capacity, I buy a book. The second example here is business to business supplies. There'll be no GST on that. However, some trips and traps. Will the purchasing business have to pay GST on the purchases? Uh, it's a reverse charge in such a case. If the business purchased the goods for personal use, so if the business acted like a consumer, not as a business, or if no GST was paid at the border when the low value goods were imported. How does the reverse charge work? Uh, that's when GST is paid by the purchaser and GST is payable at 10% of the amount paid. And then uh, the purchaser can claim back the credits that the purchaser is entitled to. There's obligations under this importing of low value goods change that applies from 1st of July, 2018. Overseas businesses who deliver um, goods under a thousand dollars to Australian consumers, will have to register for GST, will have to charge GST on sale and remit GST to the ATO by lodging return. If the overseas business does not comply to this, the ATO will register the business and calculate the liability and issue assessment and issue a 75% admin penalty to the overseas business. Anyway, it is law, but it's difficult. It's a new concept, etc. A lot of compliance. So the ATO or the government made an exception. They said if in the first year of application, that's from 1 July 2018, if the overseas business tries to comply but cannot, there'll be no penalties for the 2019 year. I have a note from 1 July 2019, next year, the 2020 year, I assume these new proposals will apply completely. GST of holding on sale of new residential premises. As you're well aware, from the 1st of July 2018, property developer that sells, say, for example, a brand new unit. Um, apologies, oh, where is it now? There it is. Um, yeah. They, um, if, if if I were to buy a brand new unit from a property developer, it will be a taxable supply to me. Say, for example, I buy a unit for $1.1 million, $1 million and $100,000 GST. Before 1 July, if I bought such a unit, I pay the $1.1 million to the developer. That's GST inclusive. The developer remits the $100,000 of GST to the ATO. Usually after three months, 
if it's on a three month bass statement um, time frame. But the problem is the ATO believes a lot of people in the construction industry and people dealing with property engage in Phoenix activities and might go bankrupt within, within those three months with the case that the ATO never received the $100,000. So they changed the law, the ATO, from 1 July 2018, and that is law now. If I were to buy a property now, a unit from a developer for one million, I pay uh, the developer only a million dollars, but the GST, I, as a private person who purchases the property, will have to remit the GST of 100000 to the ATO. So it places a lot of obligations on private purchases. So if I, as a private person, just want to buy a property, I have to fill in these two forms. Form 1, GST property settlement withholding notification, and GST property settlement date confirmation. So if you have any clients, etc., cetera, um, please get these forms um, on the ATO website um, because it has to be filled in by the purchaser. Some indirect sundry tax issues, proposed removal of GST from sanitary products. There's a new bill um, on the Senate on the 9th of May. Some issues affecting individuals. As I mentioned before, the, what was it, $530 low and middle income tax offset, that is law now. That's a proposal in this year's budget. There were three main proposals in this year's budget or two of them applies from 1st of July 2018. The other main one applies from the 1st of July 2024, so six years away. Anyway, all these proposals received the Royal Assent, so it's law now. From the 1st of July, there'll be a non-refundable $530 low and middle income tax offset. They will last four years, as I, on the diagram below, the, the, the light green arrow. There'll be prevention of bracket creep, as you're well aware, there's currently a 32.5% tax bracket. The top margin of that tax bracket is um, 87,000. They'll increase that tax bracket to the top margin of 90,000. And then from the 1st of July, 2024, that's about six years away, they want to remove the 37% tax bracket from 2025. So with the result that it will look like, if you look at the last column, Currently, we have one, two, three, four, five different tax rates, tax brackets. They only want to have four by 2025 because it will make the tax system a lot easier. <clears throat> Just one issue that was remarked by people, the 32.5% tax bracket will apply for anyone earning between $40,000 and $200,000. So someone who's on a salary, who earns a salary of $45,000 a year, will be taxed at the same rate as someone that earns a salary of $190,000 a year. Just um, not exactly the same tax, but it will be at the same tax rate or marginal tax rate of 32.5%. Note as well in the budget, um, there was a previous proposal to increase the Medicare levy from 1 July 2019 by 0.5%. Um, that proposal will not go ahead. Um, Medicare levy remains at 2%. Resident, non-resident individuals, no more main residence exemption when they sell. Um, this is a proposal, it's not yet law, but once it receives royal assent, it can have huge um, implications, especially for people who go on secondment overseas or just lives overseas for a bit and become non-residents for tax purposes of Australia and sign the contract when they are non-resident for tax purposes in Australia. Note to determine whether you're non-resident for tax purposes in Australia, that's not determined by your passport, etc. It's determined by specific tax rules. And note currently the Board of Taxation, they're busy re-examining Australia's uh, residency rules, etc. But anyway, there's some crazy consequences that can happen if this proposal does become law. For example, I live in Melbourne. I've owned my house for about 20 years. It's grown steadily in you know, um, appreciation, appreciated in value. <laughs> Let's say I bought it for 100,000, I sell it for $10 million. A huge capital gain if I sell it today. If I sell it today because I'm a tax resident of Australia, I'll satisfy main residence exemption. Say for example, I've lived there all my life. 
but let's say I now go overseas for five years and according to tax principles I become a non-resident for tax purposes of Australia and I sign the contract when I'm overseas all that capital gain will now be taxable I mean I can get CT discount etc and there might be a problem yeah working out the CT discount or splitting the CT discount because on the 8th of May 2012 and um, CD discounts be abolished for foreign residents, etc. But that's just some of the issues you must watch out for. Um, moving on, the ATO hit list, some they, they're gonna focus on work-related expenses. The ATO keeps on sending out information, watch out, we're gonna focus on work-related expenses. So three basic rules for deducting work-related expenses money must actually be spent and not reimbursed there must be a nexus between the expense and the earning of the income and keep a record to prove expenses especially because the ato is kind of fed up of people just doing automatic claims of 150 dollars for clothing and laundry without having any receipts 300 dollars for work-related expenses <coughs> or under the five thousand dollars kilometers cents per kilometers when they travel when they claim their travel allowances etc i think the current rate is 66 cents uh, it's recently been increased to 68 cents per kilometer etc five most common tax mistakes people who don't declare all their income forgetting their temporary job or working as an uber driver and not declaring that now the ato's data matching capabilities has improved so much and with technology nowadays the mere push of a button you can link all accounts etc so yeah people should watch out for that claim deductions for private expenses for example people just wearing normal clothes or myself wearing a suit to work claiming it as a work-related expense it's not a suit just what people normally wear does not qualify for um, clothing for work etc not home to work travel as well Normally, if you just travel from home to work, it's not tax deductible. However, if you travel from home to work, but you carry equipment that can't be stored at the employer overnight, etc. So say, for example, like a handyman, his big toolkit, uh, he can't store it at the employer because it's, um, it's not safe there, or yeah, etc. If a handyman travels with that, then potentially it can be tax deductible, etc. Again, it depends on tax circumstances, etc. People who are not keeping receipts or records, claiming expenses never incurred. So, say for example, these deductions are three hundred dollars for work-related expenses. Although you can claim up to three hundred dollars without producing a receipt, note if the ATO audits you, they would like to see the receipt. If they can't see a receipt that you actually did incur, however, less than and three hundred dollars no tax deduction and claiming personal expenses for rental properties so say for example you rent out your uh holiday house but only for one week in a year but then you you claim rental expenses for the whole year or for example you use it for private purposes but you still claim rental expenses you can't do that some sundry issues affecting individuals proposed increase to work related motor vehicle expenses as i said it's now 68 cents and td 2018-10 sets out the value of goods taken from stock for private use so it's for example <coughs> confectionery shops or cake shops uh, maybe you want to take some cakes back for your kids back home <coughs> and that is a withdrawal from you know your stock that you have there it's difficult to keep track of that, so the ATO gives you some standard figures, and um, most current figures are set out in TD 2018-10. Some international tax issues. Uh, the Bywater case, um, a recent TR 2018-5 and PCG 2018-D3 deals with the Bywater case. Basically in Bywater, it dealt with is the company an Australian tax resident or a non-resident for tax purposes of Australia. As you may be aware, a company um, who is not registered in Australia will be an Australian tax resident if it carries on business in Australia and has central management and control in Australia. So both those legs need to be satisfied. What is carrying on a business in Australia? 
normally it's ordinary concepts as we understand and generally we wouldn't think it means passive activities etc however tr 2017-d7 throws a bit of a spanner in the works there in our thinking and this case as well it was actually one of the first cases that prompted this whole move to maybe include passive income as active income i.e carrying on a business etc this case said explicitly or they just said central management control on its own can be carrying on a business there's no need for actual trading or investment operations the making of decisions or the fact that central management controls in australia means the company is carrying on a business in australia note just some of the facts in this case normally central management controls where the board meets so this company was not registered in australia and the board met somewhere overseas however there was an accountant in sydney although the accountant was not on the board the court deduced that basically the accountant in sydney made all the decisions and basically the overseas board were just ticking boxes and just formalities etc but the real central management control was actually in sydney australia so that's why it was a resident company uh, so that's going on a business in australia the second one what is central management control in australia first question what is central management control and then where is central management control exercise <coughs> so what is central management control traditional view is this form where does the board of directors make decisions so it's a tick there but again you know if you just tick boxes without thinking about it it's not always the best thing to do you actually have to analyze what exactly is going on so um post bywater that's the name of this case just substance over form approach where is the real business carried on so you have to do more analysis and this makes it a lot more interesting as well than merely ticking boxes so some examples where central management and control if you set investment and operational policy, that is central management control. If you appoint and revoke the appointment of company officers and agents to carry on a company business, or if you oversee and control company officers and agents, or if you make finance decisions, for example, how to declare dividends. Note, mere company administration, keeping share register and accounts and paying dividends, that is not central management control. But note, there's a bit of a sleeper, or it all depends on how you interpret things. Uh, if you manage the day-to-day -day operations without supervision, that will be central management control. However, if you manage the day-to-day -day operations under supervision, it's not central management control. Again, words, and this makes it quite interesting, tax, where you can analyze and argue different sides, even with the same words. It's quite interesting. So. Um, what is the location of central management and control? So assume you've deduced the activities in the green box. What's the location? It's not necessarily where decisions are recorded and formalized, because that's like form over substance, where the directors live or where the company is required to be controlled in directors. You have to consider a whole raft of factors, for example, where the governing body of the company meets, where the company pays dividends, where key decisions are made, and where does the minutes state that high level decisions are made? Note, the ATO will not review whether the central management control of a company is in Australia, and it will not review basically the residency, the test for Australian residency, because as you're well aware, Australian resident, if, 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 if the ATO rules that you're Australian resident, you have to pay tax on your worldwide income. That means the ATO will get more money because you're both your Australian source income as well as overseas income. Whereas if the ATO thinks that you're non-resident for tax purposes, you only pay tax in Australia on your Australian source income. Anyway, there's a bit of a letdown from the ATO saying from the 21st of June, 2018, the ATO will not review central management control to test whether you're actually an Australian resident. If the subsidiary company is subsidiary of a foreign head company, or the substantial majority of foreign subsidiary companies um, central management controls in a foreign country and the subsidiary does not enter artificial 
contrived arrangement to change location of central management control. Sorry, this is this is the and test. All three of those conditions must be present. Then the ATO will not consider residency status. Another case dealing with residency. It's a recent case uh, affecting an individual. This is Mr. Harding. Basically, I think Mr. Harding was the airplane engineer. He worked in the Middle East. Uh, there's some of his history, 1990 to 2006 in Saudi Arabia, 2006 to 2009, he worked in Australia, 2009 to 15, lived in Bahrain and worked in Saudi Arabia. Uh, for individuals, when will you be a resident of Australia and therefore pay tax on your worldwide income? There's a common law residency test. There's two tests. You can, if you satisfy one of them, you're a resident of Australia. In this case, the common law residency test, Mr. Harding did not satisfy it because he never came back to Australia, even when he, because he got divorced from his wife, didn't even come back to Australia when he separated, even though he still owned property, bank accounts, and insurance in Australia. Again, this is a common law test. So it's case law involved. It's not a clear line. It's a fact and circumstance. You have to argue how do different facts stack up against each other, etc. Anyway, it failed the common law test. Um, however, then the ATO looked at the domicile in Australia, and there's no permanent place of abode outside of Australia. Um, normally, the domicile test is basically domicile of origin. Is for example where you were born. Mr. Harding was born in Australia, so he had a domicile in Australia. Now the question was, did Mr. Harding have a permanent place of abode outside of Australia? Did he have a place where he could permanently live outside of Australia? Basically what it came down to, the court said, no, he does not have a permanent place of abode outside of Australia. Even though he lived there for however long, you know, nine years, uh, they said he didn't. One of the main reasons was because he rented. He only rented for nine years. He never bought a house. Even though he rented an apartment in the same building, a huge apartment block we moved around in apartments etc for nine years lived in the same place but he moved around he didn't own the apartment he was deemed to not have a permanent place of a boat outside of australia so uh, mr harding was judged to be a resident of australia some international tax sundry issues cbc reporting concession this is if you're a significant global entity um huge huge companies, multinational groups, they only need to lodge their country by country in reports by the 14th of September 2018. Superannuation tax issues, there's been a bill released that will crack down on superannuation fees to prevent excessive fees and inappropriate insurance. For all accounts, they want to abolish the exit fees and accounts less than $6,000 um, they want to waive the 3% oh, 3 annual cap on passive fees charged on super accounts. <coughs> they want to track down owners of lost super accounts and no more automatic insurance for people with less than $6,000 in superannuation. <coughs> There's a new bill out um, providing 12 month amnesty for businesses that fail to make superannuation guarantee payments. So this is basically a get out of jail free card for businesses that did not make superannuation guarantee payments to workers between July 1992 and 1 April 2018. Uh, the government wants to provide 12 month amnesty for such people or such businesses who did not pay superannuation guarantee in this time to their employers. Um, such businesses must come forward and disclose the amount of superannuation outstanding to the ATO to avoid penalties and possibly, yeah, harsher penalties, etc. Note they must self-correct the historical underpayments before the 24th of May 2019. That's 12 months after the 24th of May 2018. Such amnesty payments will not incur penalties and will be tax deductible. The employer must still pay the missing superannuation guarantee to the employees, as well as nominal, nominal interest and GIC, etc. If the employers don't pay their outstanding superannuation guarantee before the 24th of May 2019, then higher <coughs> penalties will be imposed on them, minimum 50%, and potentially a penalty up to 200% if no superannuation guarantee statement. So. If you haven't paid your employees in that time, you know, make sure you do it. 
other measures, there's a super guarantee opt-out that was in the recent budget. If you're lucky enough to have more than one job and you earn more than $263,157 a year, 9.5% of that is 25,000. So normally employers are, by law, they have to make 9.5% contribution of your wage. Uh, then in such a case, you can opt out to prevent excess concessional contributions. The NALI is extended to include expenses not incurred and LRBIs and total super balance. There's some rulings on that as well. Note, uh, first home super savers scheme, um, it applied from 2018, last year was the first year from which you could contribute to this scheme. From the 1st of July 2018, that's the first year you're going to draw from this scheme to enable you to buy a new house, etc. If you don't have a house already. Now there's also regulations for financial hardship, where individuals who previously owned a house but lost it because of financial hardship can also potentially qualify for the first time super saver. If affected, you can apply to the ATO to hear if you can qualify. So it's even for people who have bought a house before but because of financial hardship lost it and now want to buy a house again. So it's a good concession, helping people. The Ward case, the excess non-concessional super contribution tax upheld. In this case, Mr. Ward was a truck driver. He accessed the three-year bring forward rule twice. Note, currently, you can make non-concessional contribution of only 100,000 a year. And if you, in superannuation, qualify for the three-year bring forward rule, in one year, you can contribute 300,000. And then three years later, you can contribute another 300,000, etc. Well, Mr. Ward, the facts was for him, back when he accessed the three-year bring forward rule, the maximum he contributed to superannuation was 150,000. So he could contribute 450,000 wait three years and then contribute another 450,000. Unfortunately, in Mr. Ward's case, he contributed the 450,000, didn't wait three years and then contributed another 450,000. Based on fact scenarios, etc., because he withdrew money from super and they wanted to put it in, etc. again, doesn't matter for what reason you do it, you can't, you have to wait three years before you contribute again under the three year bring forward rule. So in this case, <coughs> the excess non concessional contribution tax were upheld. Our last section, we're almost finished. Single touch payroll, as you're well aware, uh, if you have 20 or more employees, it's compulsory to use single touch payroll going forward. Uh, Reckon can help you with your single touch payroll um, obligations. They have a STP compliant product in place. Benefits of single touch payroll, it's just basically, it's everything about data matching for the ATO. Um, because if you complete your employee's payroll, etc., the press of a button, you submit it, data goes directly to the ATO, as well as whenever you send it to your employees, etc., and when, when, when you keep the books, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, what can you do to get STP ready, etc.? You can, yeah, use a provider. Um, or alternatively, you can speak to your tax agent and they, they, they would be able to help you with that. Um, yeah, it's more similar. Quo Vardis, where guidelines of allocation of profits in professional firms. As you're well aware, the ATO had a guideline there where they create, created what they call free swimming between the flags measures. Basically dealing with a lot of professional partnerships, lawyers and accountants operates through partnerships and trusts, etc., where um, there's a way to ensure that partners pay a reasonable amount of salary to themselves, etc. So the ATO um, put out some guidelines. Those guidelines have now been repealed since the 14th of December 2017. For anything after the 14th of December 2017, you have to consult with the ATO. My understanding, the ATO is busy with consultation talking about um, uh, putting out new guidelines. Anyway, watch this space. Other issues, CT improvement threshold for 2019 is $150,386. Why is this relevant? Because you must determine if improvements to pre-CT assets constitute a separate post-CT asset. Anyway, that's all from me. Thank you very much. There's my name, Rudolf van der Meer. 
I'm National Tax Director of Nexia Australia. There's my contact details and my phone number. Please give me a call if you want to talk about anything regarding tax. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob Love, for your presentation. Our recording of today's session can be found on the Reckon Training Academy. If you have any issues assessing this, please email us at training at reckon.com and we can send you the direct link. Again, if you have any questions, please email them through training at reckon.com and we will be able to get back to you. Thank you everyone for attending this session. We hope to see you at our next tax update webinar and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.